This is, I can already tell this is a fun crowd. Um, Jim, it's so good to be here with you. Are you guys familiar with Jim's work? He's like the brain expert and makes everybody like 10 times more productive, maybe a lot more than that. So I just feel like I was saying to him on the phone, I was like, I bet you're everyone's like party trick. Like at the parties you go to, everyone pulls you aside. You're like the therapist and people just want to know how you do what you do. Um, so I thought maybe just to get started, we could do a brain exercise or something. So like everyone could benefit from what you do. Should we do that? Okay. All right. Yeah. How about, I, I mean, I certainly don't can't do yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah, I think yeah. that's you. Okay. <laughs> so um, it's great to be here. This is amazing. I and everyone who's watching this, wherever you're watching this, you're watching remotely. You can do this with us. And I believe there's no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's a there's a trained memory and there's an untrained memory. So I'll walk you through a quick exercise. All right. So what we're gonna do is, uh, how many of you came here today like to have a, a better memory? How many of you forgot why you came here today? <laughs> Have you ever done that? Have you ever walked into a room of your own home and then just forgot why you're there? Anybody ever like read a page in a book at the end and just forget what you just read? Um, forget people's names? Any, anybody? So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through a quick exercise. Have you ever gone to the store to like buy one specific thing and you come back with a bag full of things except for that one thing that you went to the store? <laughs> So the, the, the laughter of recognition, right? And so I'm gonna walk you through, um, how about my favorite brain foods? All right, I believe what you eat matters, especially for your gray matter. And there are some, there are 10 amazing foods for your brain. So I'm gonna share them with you. Don't write them down, because I'm gonna teach you how to memorize them. All right, all right. So they are avocados, blueberries, I like to call them brain berries, broccoli, very good for your brain, olive oil, great for the brain, if your diet allows, eggs, the choline in eggs is really great for cognitive health. Green leafy vegetables like kale and spinach, your, your mom was right. Um, wild salmon or sardines, uh, the fish oil is really good for the brain. Uh, here's a fun one, turmeric. Turmeric, uh, I make like a, add it to an almond milk or something and make like a golden milk and it's really good, lowers inflammation, which is good for your brain. Uh, walnuts, which happen to look like the human brain. And uh, my favorite of all, dark chocolate. Very, very good for the brain. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you really quickly how to memorize this. So you could um, stand up, stand up. <laughs> I guess I should stand up too. All right. I'm going to so, stand up too. All right. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a 2,500-year-old <laughs> memory technique. You know, before there was a printing press, how people would memorize things, and it's called, and I call it PIE, P-I-E, remembering people's names, remembering grocery lists, anything you read, P-I-E, as easy as PIE. Not that pie is not a, a, a brain food, okay? Um, maybe blueberry pie, maybe. I don't know. But the P stands for place. We remember things based on place. And how many of you, peop how many of you forget someone's name and you ask yourself, where do I know the person? Because the context gives you the content. All right. Um, the I stands for imagine. We remember things better that we imagine. How many of you are much better with faces than you are with names? At these events, you go to somebody, say, I recognize your face. I mean, I remember your face, but I forgot your name. You never go to someone and say the opposite. You never go to someone and say, I remember your name, but I forgot your face. <laughs> that wouldn't make a lot of sense, right? We tend to remember what we see because we think in pictures, right? If I was to ask you to describe your home or how many windows, you, you, would, you would see the pictures of it, right? And finally, the E is you entwine. You, you entwine, you connect the place and the image. So let me show you. Let's take 10 places on our body. And this is what this is like Simon says. I want you to say it and touch it. Ready? Repeat after me. One is top. Say it out loud. One is top. Two is nose. Nose. We're just going right down the body. Three is mouth. Four, ears. Five, throat. All right? And you're doing this wherever you're watching this, right? So let's do it again. One is what? Top. Top of your head. Nose. Mouth. Ears. Throat. That's five. Six, shoulders. Good. Seven, collar. Eight, your fingers. Nine is your belly, and 10 is your bottom. All right, do we have top to bottom? And one more time, top, top. top. nose, mouth, ears, throat, shoulders. Very good. Fingers, good, <laughs> belly. It's, all right, so that's the P, we have 10 places. So the ancient Greeks, in order, I wrote the chapter on memory, which is the largest chapter in, in Greece, uh, because I found out there's a goddess of memory. 
which is fascinating to me. And, and she is the mother of the nine muses of our literature and science. So like, that's how important memory is. And they used to remember things based on space. The, se the eye is imagined. So you're going to imagine the food and the E is entwined. You're going to imagine it in the place. All right. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to do. What's the top? What's the first place? Great. The first food, avocados. So you're going to use your imagination, pretend you're eight years old, and mm -hmm. you're putting uh, guacamole as a hair conditioner. All right? Mm -hmm. Does if it makes you laugh, that's why you remember it. Okay. All right? Do you see it? All right, we're going to go through the rest fast. Second place is what? Yeah. And blueberries. All right, brain berries coming out of your what? What does that feel like? What does that smell like? All right, what, what does it taste like? <laughs> All right, going third place is what? Mouth. Mouth. I want you to imagine a large piece of uh, broccoli in your teeth. <laughs> but it's like not small, but it's like unusually like uncomfortable. Does everybody <laughs> taste that? Yeah. Fantastic. Rest fast. Fourth is what? Ears. Olive oil. What can you picture? Cl cleaning your ears with olive oil, olive <laughs> earrings. Picture something, right? If you can see it, you'll remember it. Number five is what? Throat. Throat. Instead of an Adam's apple, imagine a hard boiled egg. All right. Eggs, good for your, your memory. All right. We're halfway there. Six. Green leafy vegetables. So I want you to imagine shoulder pads made out of kale and <laughs> spinach. Kale and spinach? Good. Seven is what? Your collar. And it's uh, wild salmon and sardines. So I want you to imagine a necklace that's like maybe of <laughs> salmon sushi. <laughs> I'm, I'm hungry. It's dinner time. But OK, so, uh, do you ever want to feel that necklace? <laughs> maybe it's a little bit old. So it was a, yeah, OK, good. Eight is what? Your fingers? fingers. Turmeric. So imagine there's your fingers are covered in that golden powder. Mm -hmm. You can't get it off, all right? And then finally, nine and 10, nine is what? Yeah. I want you to imagine walnuts coming out of your what? Your <laughs> belly button, all right? Uh, vitamin E is very good for your brain. And then finally, 10 is what? Bottom, mm -hmm. dark chocolate. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even want to know what, what you're thinking. All right, now you are the memory experts. You're, you know, and so basically, keep you standing. So, so Jordan calls you up and say, hey, at, at, at the crowd, we're going to have a super brain party, a limitless brain party, and can you stop by Whole Foods on the way here? Can you please pick up these 10 foods? And you're like, oh, I can't write them down because I'm driving. All, you have them. You have them right on your body. So you're walking around the aisles. What's the first food you need? Avocado. Great. Blueberry. Out loud. Go. Broccoli. Broccoli. Olive, oil. olive oil. Eggs. Very good. Spinach and kale, good. <laughs> Salmon. Salmon, very good. Turmeric. Walnuts, Walnuts and chocolate. give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> By the way, can you do it backwards? You can say, <laughs> no. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Walnuts, turmeric, Salmon. Very good. Green leafy. Very nice. Eggs. Yes. Olive oil. Very good. Broccoli, blueberries, All right, give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> so I use the pie method uh, for remembering names and faces. Um, you take the place, the, uh, something on a, on a person's body, or maybe like an earrings that they're wearing, or jewelry, or, or their hair. I imagine their name. So if a person's name is Mark, I would imagine I mean, maybe their place is uh, their forehead. Big check mark on their forehead. Right in the <laughs> privacy of, of your own of your own mind, not sharing this. Person's name Mary. I would imagine them carrying lambs at the party. And when I say goodbye, I was like, oh, she was carrying lambs. What's her name? Right. Mm -hmm. um, if the person's name is David, I use a slingshot. Why? Because of David and Goliath. They just hit him right in the nose, and I'll just I can't forget that. And once it's a means to an end. Once you know the person's name, the picture disappears. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's just kind of a fun way to pay attention and keep you present. I feel like South by Southwest is the perfect time to learn that because I feel like I keep running into people and I'm like, I think I know their name. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, your online courses are now used by students in mm -hmm. over 100 countries and your content has reached over 300 million views. So I think it's easy. It's, it's safe to say it, it resonates with folks. Yeah. Um, when I interviewed, when I interview folks, I love to look at the why, like why they are the way they are. And I think we can not to get to whatever about it, but like go back to ch your childhood. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> we've got time. Um, Jim as a small child, a 
teacher points to you and refers to you as the boy with the broken brain. Yeah. Why and um, how did that impact um, the work you do today? So I don't know how many people grew up with some learning ch challenges. Maybe just at school, you didn't feel like it was necessarily for, for you. I realized that it's not how smart you are, it's how are you smart. It's not how smart your friends are, your, your significant other is, your kids. It's how are they smart. And I feel like we all have a superpower. Um, and I, I learned it kind of the hard way. I had a traumatic brain injury when I was five, um, rushed to the emergency room, and my, my parents said I was never the same after that. Where I, before I was very curious, very energized and playful, I became very shut down. My, my superpower, as you know, is just, it was being invisible. Because I never knew the answers. I couldn't read for three years. and. You know, I was being teased a lot, so teacher came to my defense and pointed me out in front of the whole class, saying this this kid is different, but called said I was broken, and that's all I remembered. So that that inner talk, adults have to be very careful of their external words because they become a child's internal words, if that if that mm. makes sense. And so I believe even even here, you know, if someone asked me and they were like, Jim, I just have a horrible memory, and I'll just stop. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. You know, so many people say, oh, I'm too old, I'm, I'm not smart enough, and then whatever, our brains are this incredible supercomputer, and our self-talk is the program that will run. So if you tell yourself, I'm not good at remembering people's names at South by you will not remember people's names while you're here, <laughs> because that's how powerful your mind is. Well, and you go from being this shy, reserved, uh, introverted kid who was told they had a broken brain, yeah. right? Uh, how did you transform this into a superpower? So I believe um, adversity can become an advantage. I really do. That with challenge comes change. How many of you have had an experience in your life that you wouldn't wish upon anybody, but you got a strength, you found clarity, you found a, you know a mission? And I think my inspiration was my desperation. And you know I'm very passionate about learning. I wasn't always because I had challenges till the age of 18. But um, I think passion is what lights you up. So learning lights me up. And I think purpose is how you use that passion to light other people up. So my passion is learning. My purpose is teaching people how to learn so they could light, light themselves up. Was there a moment you could go to that you were like, hmm, I, I can actually do this. And not only am I not broken, but like I can actually you know, figure out the system and, and do this 10 times better than, than most people. Like, What was that moment? What was the aha moment for you? You asked such great questions. Um, <laughs> So when I was 18, I learned I um, I was ready to give up, give up school because I, I thought being I was lucky to get into a state uh, local college and I I thought a freshman meant I could make a fresh start and mm -hmm. I struggled so much and I wanted to make my family proud and show the world show myself I could do it and uh, I take all these classes and I do way worse and I was ready to quit because I didn't have the money to be there in the first place and. Um, a friend of mine was like, don't tell your parents you're going to quit yet. I'm going home this weekend. Why don't you come with and get some perspective? And I think when we change an environment, like the place or yeah. the people we're in, we get a new point of view. And, uh, and I, the, the family, when we're there, is very well off, very different than I, I had access to. But the father walks me around the water and the property before dinner and asks me a very innocent question, how's school? And that's the worst question you could ask me. And I was mm. I break down in front of this complete stranger, and I tell him my whole story, broken brain, I'm ready to quit. And he's like, well, why are you in school? What do you want to be, do, have, share? And I honestly had no idea. No one's ever asked me that before. Mm. I, thought, I thought you were in school because that's you're, what you're supposed to do. And uh, I tell him about my situation, and, and he asked me, like, well, you know, my bucket list. What do I want to be, do, have? And I start writing it down, and he rips it out of my hand, and I'm freaking out because I've never shared my dreams with anybody, and there's a complete stranger. And I'm feeling, you know, afraid of being judged, right? Yeah. Imposter, just everything that comes along with self-doubt. And um, and he and he looks at me. He's like, Jim, you are this close to everything on that list. And he spreads his index fingers like a foot apart. And I'm thinking, give me ten lifetimes, I'm not going to crack that list. And then he takes his two fingers. May I? Like he goes like this, uh -huh. like this. Uh -huh. Meaning, w what's in between is like the bridge, the you know, my brain. And he takes me into his home, into a room I've never seen before. It's wall to wall, ceiling to floor, covered in books. And you know, I'm, I can't even read, so it's like being in a room full of snakes. But he starts grabbing these snakes and handing them to me. And they're the incredible, um, these tit the titles are books of incredible men and women in history, mm -hmm. and some very early personal growth books. And he gets me to commit to reading one book a week. And um, you know, and th those are the things that help unlock these power. I believe knowledge is not only power, it's profit that the faster you can learn and is the faster you can earn. 
and that that's really what I dedicated my life to. Wow. Um, you talk about God. We were even talking because I I gave you my book earlier, and you were like, "Oh yeah, I, I used to read a book a day." And I'm like, "What? Yeah. Like who does that?" So it's just it, you have a process, mm -hmm. and it's not even because you say so many of these really interesting things, but you truly live by them, right? Um, and you yeah. have, and so can you give us some tips? Like, first of all, how do you train yourself to read a book a day? Yeah. Um, and then how you talk about upgrading your your brain mm -hmm. like what are some real yeah. tangible things people can Let's do, do it. you know yeah i love this i loved your book and i, I read it on the way here i'm not just trying and to show my book i promise no, 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 it's I, just, I, I thought I'll, it was no, no, super I'll, interesting I'll, when he was no, like I'll, I'll say it when he you, was like when he was like oh I, I used to read a book a day or I, I read now i have four a week i'm like what you know yeah that's um, interesting so special characters by the way this, <laughs> you want to you want to get this book it just came out a few days ago and i really enjoyed it it was not only you know education of power yeah. but it was it was really it was it, it was really entertaining also as well <laughs> um yeah and plus you've spent so, so much time with so many amazing thinkers and, and 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 entrepreneurs um i believe genius leaves clues and that's why if you could read a book you could download decades into days that that's the greatest advantage period that there is if somebody has decades of experience and they put into a book and you can sit down a few days and read that book that that's you save time right that's the one thing that you you can't pay for and so um i really value reading um i didn't always feel that way um and there's certain things you could do to read a, a more often most people don't do it because they're not good at it how many people you read a page and you just forget what you just read you know how many of you have buy books and they sit on your shelf <laughs> unread and it becomes shelf help not self-help right <laughs> and that's the challenge and so what i would say is um simple tip um you can read a book a week, 52 books a year. The average book has about 64, th according to Amazon, 64,000 words. Um, the average person reads 200 words a minute. That means if you divide the numbers together, it takes about 320 minutes to get through one book, which sa sounds daunting, but if you divide it by seven days in a week, that's 45 minutes a day. I mean, it's not unreasonable. And you could do 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, 25 minutes, and get through one book a week. The average person reads two books a year Right. That's why if wow. people have seen photos of me with Oprah or Elon or with these individuals, uh, Bill Gates, we, we bonded over books. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like le reading is also a great mental exercise. It's reading is to your mind what exercises to your body. Um, and audiobooks are great also as well yeah. for people. How many preferred read listening than, than reading? Um, I put a link right like a little while ago, right on my Instagram just today. Um, and I put in one hour master class on speed reading that you can take for free. So if you, if you go, if, and if you go there, you can just access it and have a book and get those benefits. You go, so you mentioned Oprah. Um, you have gone into these places like Facebook and SpaceX. You talked with Oprah Winfrey and, and told some of these people how to optimize their brains. First yeah. of all, I'm just curious, you meet so many successful people. Is there a through line of, of something you noticed and, yeah. and all and something they need need help with when optimizing their brains or yeah, something yeah, they yeah, all yeah. struggle with? And and then second, what do you tell them? Like what's the one takeaway? Yeah. Like what can we do that you've told Oprah to do? So mm -hmm. so what I would say is that um, everybody's we all struggle with the with, with common things, right? Uh, distractions. How many feel like it's hard to maintain your focus in a world full of rings and pings and dings and app notifications? You know, we also suffer from overload. How many of you feel like there's too much to learn, too little time? Like you're taking a sip of water out of a fire hose. You're drowning in information, but you're starving for like filters and wisdom. Um, how many of you feel like you're losing, you're more forgetful than ever? So I could work with a, a quarterback and, and help them remember. It's all context dependent, but concussions that they've had or memorizing playbooks or reaction time and thinking speed um, we do a lot on creativity i believe the future belongs to the creators where a lot of jobs are being automated or artificial you go to artificial intelligence what's not going to be as easily is the things that are make us human our creativity our ability to solve problems empathy emotional intelligence and all that can be expanded it's not fixed like your shoe size um, i would say i always start with self-care because i believe self-care is not selfish and so eating those good foods are so important for you. Optimizing your sleep. Uh, y so many achievers, they, you know, they pull these all-nighters because they're right. always sacrificing and they're hustling. And, and I'm all for hard work. And I also think 
it's not just working hard, it's working intelligently and smart also as well. And I think one of the ways of getting there is really focusing on the lead dominoes. So I help people really hone in on the, that 10% of the, the activities that give them 90% of the, the, the rewards. And that would be the foods you eat, the people you spend time with. That, that's why community is so important. So right, right, with daily, uh, our ability to communicate, connect at South By, and because you, who you spend time with is who you become. And we start modeling people around us unconsciously. We use their words, their actions, their thoughts, their character, their habits, right? And I would say that, um, you know, if you spend time with nine broke people, be careful, because you're gonna be number 10, right? <laughs> and, that's, and that's how it works. But having a positive peer group, um, stress management, we talked right. about this. Chronic stress shrinks the human brain. And so, you know, how well are you coping with stress? And those individuals that you mentioned have a high level of responsibility, right. you know, and that could lead to stress and anxiety. And so, anyone here meditate? Or, is, or do anyone feel like, like they try, but they're not sure if they're doing it right? <laughs> like, and so, th there, are, there are activities you could do, you know, based on your chronotype. Your, there's a time type. We all have four different types based on our biology and hormonal profile. How many of you are early birds? Ra raise your hand. How many of you are much more productive in, at night? You're in more a night owl, right? So there's these different archetypes, and there's reasons why that happens. And so when you know your chronotype, you know the best time to check emails. You know the best time to work out. You know the best time to go to sleep or to drink your coffee or to make love or to study for that exam. So it's, there's not a magic pill, but there certainly is a magic pr process. Well, I just want to know. So you deal with all these super successful people, and you you go into these spaces. I'm just sure you've seen some weird stuff, right? I, I mean, um, what's what's like the most interesting, I, and I know you probably have, it's probably like wanna, private, like, yeah, but um, <laughs> you know, can you take me into one of these sessions? And like, you can drop names if you want. Uh, uh, well, I guess we're live streaming. Um, yeah, yeah, this is what this is what I do. I put people in the hot seat. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but is there anyone that really stuck out to you in that process and that, that session? Like, take me into a session, like, yeah, with you, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Oprah, what are you saying to me? No, no, no. Well, I just I would, wanted to say yeah, I'm yeah, Oprah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and I would, I, would love to ask, I would love to ask you the same question. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm so happy I'm on the other side of this. <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of your, well, that's it's great, because a lot of yours is archived, your, your interviews. Right, that's that, true. That's, that's good. That's true. Um, I don't know, I work with a lot of actors uh, mm -hmm. to help them speed read scripts, to memorize their lines, to be focused on set. Um, one of, one of a great experience for me because I love learning from people and I think everybody could, we can learn. Um, I will, uh, I'll, I'll drop a couple names, sure. Um, <laughs> because it helps to, the tea no, you because guys. it helps you remember things better. Because if yeah. I just talked about like, you know, uh, you know, Bill Smith, people mm -hmm. might, but if it's Will Smith, then it's a little, you know, it's different, <laughs> right? Um, right? So uh, a couple of quick things. Um, will did the endorsement, not the cover endorsement for our book and it's very blessed. Um, we were doing a training in um, in Toronto, and he was filming at night, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Dead of winter, February, and people and we're, we're it's it's two o'clock in the morning, and I'm with his family outside, and we're we're crazy cold, and but during the break he comes and he, uh, well let me back up. Earlier that day I taught him a, a technique called your dominant question, and your dominant question we have about 60,000 thoughts a day, and a lot of these thoughts come in the form of questions, questions we're asking ourselves. And our questions determine everything in our life. It determines what we focus on, how we feel, what we do. And there's a question you ask more than any other question in the world. And once you know it, it explains a lot of your behavior and the behavior of your spouse and the people of your kids and the, your coworkers. And we found out his dominant question is, how do I make this moment even more magical? Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't even realize where that question came from, but he asks himself 100 times a day. And, and that night, fast forward, when we're freezing outside during a break, he would make hot cocoa for us, even though there was a whole crew that would do that. He brought us blankets because we were mm -hmm. shivering. He t cracked jokes. He told stories. And I realized he was living his dominant question. You know, my mm -hmm. dominant question growing up as a kid was, how do I shrink down? How do I not be seen? Because I didn't have the answers. I couldn't read. I couldn't, you know, I wasn't smart. So I would sit behind the tall kid, right? I would make myself sick and go to the nurse's office. I have a friend who found out her dominant question is, how do I get people to like me? You don't know anything about her, her age, her background, her ethnicity, what she does, but you know a lot about her personality. If somebody is obsessed with how do I get this person to like me, you know, you 
people take she's a people pleaser she's a martyr she's a sicko fan her personality changes depending on who she spends time with and you know nothing but the one her dominant question so my question for everybody is what do you think your dominant question is hmm. you know and so i feel like um if you find out that if you just kind of get quiet or when you're under stress see where your mind goes that's that's where your focus goes um God, that's such an interesting question. I've never heard anyone ask that question, like, what's your dominant question? Yeah, How you, do you what, discover what do you it? You just kind of like sit there and ask the, the question that just circles in your mind all the time? Yeah, some people journal or, yeah. or they you know do some kind of talk therapy. Or when you're under a difficulty or demand or a dilemma, usually our mind goes there. Like yeah. some people's dominant question is, how do I get, how, why, why does this happen to me? And that's, they mm -hmm. ask that all the time, right? Yeah. And then they see answers all the time. Some people ask is, how can I be so stupid? And they yeah. come, that's their dominant question. My question morphed to how do I make this better? Because I thought I was broken, and mm. so I wanted to fix myself. So how do I fix this? And I started getting answer, answer, yeah. answer. And I'm that's what you live out every day in, in your life. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious, like, if what? something comes to your mind. Oh, like, great. <laughs> like, like, like one or two questions that you think that, you know, a favorite oh, question man. that you probably ask yourself. And you might not even be conscious of it, but I think it directs everything. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I put you on the spot. I think, oh, <laughs> well, it's funny. I was listening to you think about that. And I've always asked do it if I'm if I'm good enough, right? But yeah. this feels like a therapy session. I feel now I'm going like, to not make <laughs> eye contact with anyone on my way out of here. Um, but I think if you see my work, it's like I always try to one up, one up, one up. And I, yeah. don't, I don't stay in the same place because of that. Because I always want to um, try to be better and more successful or more. And, and I view success as not just what success looks like on paper but really satisfaction and believing i can cool. live up to a, a certain standard so that and that can go for better and for worse so i think that's something but i'm sure i have more um i like it. i i, I want to talk a little bit about anxiety i don't know yeah. how many people here have anxiety um but i can imagine it's a lot of folks um and I, I saw something you said about turning anxiety uh, into a superpower. And, and you know, I've been someone who, I've been in the public eye for a while. I was our senior tech correspondent for CNN, so I've been on TV uh, my mm -hmm. whole career. And I noticed something a long time ago, which was I totally have anxiety, <laughs> right? Which is interesting because, I you know, yeah. when you're someone who lives in a public way and you can talk to everybody and you can work a room and all those types of things, like, there's this, I, I'm a corner person and I like yeah. to kind of be in the corner. And I noticed that I, I understand that more uh, as I get older, but I know so many of them, even the most successful yeah. people I know struggle with anxiety. Um, and so how do you turn something like that? I guess I'm not just yeah. asking for a friend. I'm asking for myself. How do you do you turn that into a, a superpower? So um, I, I really do believe that with challenge comes change. That when we are when we challenge, just like when we work on a, a muscle, physical muscle, it grows. I think our emotional muscles are the same way. I also want to put emotions into perspective, meaning that um, I don't. I, I think all emotions serve a purpose, right? And so I don't want anyone to, to. I wouldn't want to judge myself based on the emotions I'm feeling because that's the human experience. I also know that I look at emotions and feelings as signposts. That there are signposts that we need to take in action that you don't feel things for the sake of just feeling them. If you feel fear of public speaking, which is a common one, I don't know if you saw, like, that, um, that's a big, yeah. that terrifies me personally. <laughs> but, um, but if I feel that fear, it's, it's to prep an action, which is I need to prepare, right? And so I think fear could be very useful. Now, chronic fear, just like chronic stress shrinks the human brain, chronic fear actually suppresses your immune system, a whole area of, called psycho immune uh, psychoneuroimmunology meaning that it'll make you more susceptible to colds, the colds the flus the viruses and so on um, there are also by the way some foods that amplify anxiety and there's a I, I we have a podcast um, that, uh, that that's on Spotify iTunes YouTube everything a 20 minute show uh, no and no sponsors and I interviewed this one woman Liana Warner Gray and she wrote a book called anxiety free with foods and it talks about the foods that actually lower anxiety and mm. certain foods that actually amp it up um, I would also say, you know, lack of sleep and self-care, all that makes a difference. I would finish, though, with this, that I have a quote in Limitless saying, life is the C between B and D. B is birth, D is death, life C, choice. 
that these difficult times, they could define you, these difficult times can diminish you, or these difficult times can develop you. Ultimately, we decide. And so having a level of agency, I think that, you know what a through line is with a lot of, um, I've had the opportunity to meet a number of the individuals that yeah. were in the book, which are amazing. I didn't even know that, like the, the history and the, con like, the story, so it was so rich. Um, I think another through line besides pattern recognition, I, I think that's that's part of genius. That genius uh, leaves clues, you know. Also, also as well is agency, meaning they they feel like they identify more with a thermostat than a thermometer. Meaning a thermometer, if there's a thermometer on the wall inside, all a thermometer does its only function it reacts to the environment. And as human beings, we react to things. We react to the weather, how people treat us, the economy, politics. But in actuality, the happiest people and cultures are the ones that feel like they have more agency. And so a, a thermostat has agency. Mm -hmm. A thermostat doesn't react to the environment. It knows the temperature, it gauges the environment, but what does it do? It sets a temperature and, uh, you know, and what, is, what happens to the environment? The environment reacts to it, right? And so that's, that temperature is a standard, it's a goal, it's a vision. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we have to own it. Um, like re, re, uh, years ago, I got to introduce two. I talk about superheroes a lot because I taught myself how to read by reading comic books. And um, two individuals, modern day superheroes, wanted to meet each other. I go, we go to dinner. It was Richard Branson and Stan Lee, by mm -hmm. Stan, not Stan Lee, but Stan Lee. And we're in the car, and I'm flipping out because he's my, you know, he created all my heroes. And Laurie, I was, I was like, <laughs> you created all my favorite superheroes, he, and I, I need to know who's your favorite. And he mm -hmm. looks at me, he says, Jim, it, it's Iron Man, all right? And he said, Jim, who's your favorite superhero? And he had this big, I post on Instagram, like a big Spider-Man tie. It's like, Spider-Man. And without a pause, he says, with his iconic voice, with great power <laughs> comes great <laughs> response. And you all know that, right? You don't even remember when you first right. heard it. And I... I don't talk about this a lot, but because of my brain injuries, I, I, I reverse things when I hear it sometimes and I, when I read it. And, um, and I heard something different. I was like, Stan, you're right. With great power comes great responsibility. And the opposite is also true. With great responsibility comes great power. Mm. When we take responsibility for something, we have great power to make things better. You know, and it's, it's good because a lot, a lot of people complain or they make excuses or they divert blame or whatever. And then we give our power away and we give away our sovereignty. And I'm saying when we take responsibility, we have the ability to, to respond, not react, yeah. but really respond. Um, I know we have to wrap soon, but I, I think, first of all, that's such a great point. And I... I want to ask you, so there's a part, um, one of the themes of my book, and I've mentioned this to you before, but uh, mm -hmm. having interviewed some of the most successful entrepreneurs, right, folks like Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey and um, Travis. and Travis Kalanick and a lot of these entrepreneurs that shaped um, society, I, I look at you and you're extremely successful. You're the top of the game in what you do. Um, no one I know who's had extraordinary success uh, hasn't, done so without either failure or what I call these lobster moments yeah, and wow. in my book uh, tell them what lobster moments are. so in in my book there's um, a theme it's when I had wanted to leave my job um, at CNN and and go off and a lot of people didn't understand why I would want to do that um, I had been obsessed with this uh, YouTube video of a rabbi talking about how lobsters grow and he just he was talking about how the only way for lobsters to grow is for them to completely shed their shell which is you know, okay, but but what's interesting about that is the rabbi also said it's the most stressful moment for lobsters, and they're very vulnerable and can get eaten, so that's also not great for lobsters. But the only way for them to grow is for them to shed their shell, and then over and over and over again. So it's this great metaphor for change. Of change is uncomfortable, and uh, you're very vulnerable, and str and it's very stressful. And I think it's a great metaphor for technology and how so many of these people change the world. You could argue for better and for worse, but um, I think it's also a great metaphor for our personal lives and, and having lobster moments. So yeah. because I consider you incredibly successful, I can only imagine you've had many lobster moments. So if you could maybe end by talking us through one of your, um, your uh, lobster yeah, moments yeah, yeah. And, and maybe what it, it led to. Are you going to share too? No, oh, come on. <laughs> That'll be fair. <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm happy to share. Okay, so um, I, I'd be concerned if I didn't have these challenges because again, I think adversity is your advantage. 
uh, with challenge comes change. With difficulty, it creates a demand on ourselves. And my, my dominant question through challenge is, where's the gift in this? And that's my dominant question. I Think about it. My, my two biggest challenges were learning and public speaking. And the universe has a sense of humor, because what, what do I do? <laughs> I'm just public speaking every day on what topic, <laughs> right, this thing called learning. So I, I do believe our struggles could be our superpowers and be our strengths, that you can take a mess and turn into message. Um, more recently, I don't, I don't share this, but um, I have very bad sleep issues. Um, for From 2000 to 2015, I slept 90 minutes a night on average, in total. And I have uh, I found out mm -hmm. that I did a, at UCLA a big sleep study, and I have severe, severe sleep apnea. It's mm -hmm. not because my mind is ruminating. I have very good practice. I fall asleep fast, but I keep on waking up because I suffocate. I stop breathing like a few hundred times a night. Each time is at least 10 seconds. So the doctors are like, you no know, wonder you're not sleeping. It's like somebody coming 300 times a night, putting a pillow over your wow. face. And to do what I do is very difficult because I have to be mentally present, right? And it didn't help back in school. I developed bad habits where I would pull all-nighters because I had to work three times harder as everybody. So I had really bad hygiene, sleep hygiene. And then my career, I travel half the time. I could be on three continents in one week. So time zones, jet lag, and wow. for, you know, like hotel rooms. And so, you know, and now I'm learning, like, where's the gift in this, right? Now, I had surgery. They took out my uvula, soft palate. Mm -hmm. You know, my tonsils are really, real sexy. But I... I, I then my, my sleep jumped to four hours. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a big jump from 90 minutes. And still I ask, where's the gift in it? And I'll tell you two. Number one, it forced me to double down on everything I teach. I can roll out of bed at three o'clock in the morning and do this because I just document, what, I just share what I do, right? You know, because I believe, you know, I, want, I don't want people, it's shame on me if, if somebody's suffering the way I did and I don't, I, have, I feel more obligation to help them. And then the second thing I realized that I, I also don't overcommit. Because so many people, present company included, I would guess, say yes way too much. Mm. And it, it opens up so many tabs mentally, and it takes up energy and space. And I feel like, you know, it's cliche, you know, good to great, Jim Collins, you have to say no to good, say yes to great. Um, but I d I, everything for me is a hell yes or hell no. Like, honestly, when, I, when we got yeah. connected, or Jordan, and you know, I, my instant thing was like, yes, I want to do it, mm -hmm. because I'm so clear about my, my what I want, what my purpose is, and so I don't overcommit, and then I could be completely present, even if I, you know, just flew in from another country to get here and perform, yeah. because I'm all in, and I and I feel like that that, that was a big gift, mm -hmm. and you know, and little by little, a little becomes a lot, and so also I think it's good for me to suffer and struggle because you know what it feels like so you could help somebody else yeah. you know like you know i go skydiving and zero g and swim with sharks with no k i do this because i, I i'm learning to fly a plane you know before covid mm -hmm. to, because i want to feel like what it feels like to not know how to do something so when i'm teaching speed reading or memory or learning language, whatever it is you know to feel i think it makes you more empathetic to, to yeah. people's struggle i love that but your, your, oh. your answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought I was gonna be like, and scene. Um, you know, I and I write a little bit about this in my book, but I had my whole identity was CNN for so many years because I got my start at CNN. I became our senior technology correspondent. I was there for over a decade. Um, by the end of my career, I uh, at CNN, I had interviewed. I was the person Zuckerberg would talk to. I'd interviewed him probably three or four times in the last years, and um, and it interviewed every most major tech founders and. I just wanted desperately to go. I just, the, the nature of cable news had changed. Um, I used to do long form investigative work. We were, it was replaced by panels and talking heads and this was the Trump era and, and I still love my colleagues over there. It just, um, I wanted to do something different and I was terrified of that. Um, and it was a really difficult decision for me and that's when I had become obsessed with this idea of how lobsters grow because it was the job, you know, in Devil Wears Prada, it's like the job everyone would kill for, you know, you're uh, on TV doing the thing, you're interviewing, you're the go-to for all this stuff, but I wanted to create my own, uh, my own company where I could cover tech mm -hmm. and humanity the way I wanted to cover it with nuance and all of those things. Um, but who was I without CNN? And that was a big question for me. And so I finally made the decision I was going to do it. It's like inside baseball media stuff. My contract was about to be up. Didn't want to renew. I'm like going through agents and all this stuff. And 
I remember walking to Jeff Zucker's office at the time, and he was my mentor. Um, and I was trying to tell him I wanted to leave. And Jeff is not a person you tell you want to leave, but he was trying to negotiate with me. And I had, remember I put on my like heels and I was like, Seagull, don't back down. Um, and he started convincing me and he was saying like, just give me a couple interviews a year. And I was like, well, if I give them to you, then am I going to give them to someone else? And I was like, Seagull, what are you even saying? You know, like, am I even making sense? And then I just said to him, I have to tell you how lobsters grow, Jeff. <laughs> and so he like went and sat on the couch and I explained to Jeff Zucker how lobsters grow. Um, and that's how I quit my job. And my God, like, was it the best thing I've ever done? I've grown so much. Um, and I don't need Lori from CNN. I can just be Lori. Um, and it was extraordinary. And all these things came out of it. And it's hard and it was uncomfortable. And even two years later, or three years later, it, it, looking back, it feels like it made so much sense. But at the time, um, it was the stress and vulnerability of letting that shell go. And I'm sure there will be many more shells I let go. But I guess that's yeah. my lobster moment. I yeah. love that. Yeah. I, I have a firm belief that there's a version of all of us you know, that, that we haven't met yet. And I think the goal is, you know, to show up every single day for ourselves and until we're introduced. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I use the metaphor of butterfly because well, kind of like the lobster, it's like a, while the beauty is in the butterfly, the growth happens in the cocoon, right? It's that creature's willingness to it develop its strength by pushing itself out, yeah. you know, and not being contained. And then it gets sort of new heights. Wonderful. Yeah. I love it. Well, Jim, thank you so much. And you guys, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Cool. Thanks.